Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman and welcome to Dispatch number three from CES 2018. This will be our last dispatch of the show, but I still have some more content coming, so you'll be uh, seeing some of that throughout the week here. Now I do want to let you know first that this is being sponsored by Silicon Dust, the makers of the HD Home Run. It is my favorite television tuner for getting your over-the-air signals or cable TV signals brought into your home to watch it on any device that you want the way you want. Very liberating thing, and of course it really has built the channel. Uh, tomorrow or the next day, we're going to have an interview with Ted Head, the CEO of Silicon Dust, to talk about the status of the product line, where things are going. So be on the lookout for that. We do that every year. I know a lot of you uh, like that discussion. So that's happening very shortly. And today, we are in the big money area of CES, which is the main convention hall. Right now, we're in South Hall. And you can take a look around here as I uh, show some B-roll of just what it looks like. These are all the big, expensive booths of companies that are trying to make an impact, kind of show their competitors they mean business, and also show us members of the media that they mean business, too. So we'll try to find as many of those booths as we walk around today. And this is a very overwhelming place to be. I've been to CES now three times, and I never feel like I can get to all the things that I want to get to because there is just so much. It takes over much of, of Las Vegas, and it is just impossible to cover everything. That's why I like to look for things that the other channels really aren't looking at, uh, which are some of the hidden gems of the show. Probably not going to find too many hidden gems here, but I do want to start looking for some things that are coming from brands that we know that might be of interest and might be falling under the radar of some of the other folks there. So let's go have a look around and see what we can find. So we are in the, uh, the huddle here of the Razor booth, and they've got a new project here. This is a concept called the Linda Project, and what it involves here is a uh, mobile phone from Razor, and they have these really high-performance Android phones now. And they have this dock here. This is a laptop dock with a really high performance display. I think she said it was 120 hertz or 60 hertz. It's a really nice gaming display. You dock the phone up into this thing. It becomes like a little trackpad and a second screen. And then the main display lights up here. They've got a mouse hooked up to it here, and you can uh, essentially make this work like a laptop. Uh, no price yet on this because this is still a concept. They like to put these things out and see what kind of reaction there is to it. But the phone is available, I believe, for $6.99. So we're at the Sennheiser booth, and this is an audio company, obviously, that makes some really high-end headphones and really good stuff. And they've got something here called uh, the Ambio Smart Headset. We're going to be looking at this soon. Uh, what these are are not only an in-ear headset for your mobile phone. These actually work with iPhones, but they record out of both ears. And what's significant about this is, if you think about it, uh, the recording mechanism, the microphones, are spaced equally apart based on where your ears are located so that when you play audio back, it's very immersive because the recording is being picked up from where your ears pick up sound. And I think if you are a vlogger or somebody likes to give people a real experience knowing that your viewers are listening on headphones, this is going to blow them away because they don't need anything special to listen back to this. It's standard audio, but the audio is coming from uh, microphones positioned where your ears are. Really cool stuff. Uh, these are a little expensive, $299, but uh, Sennheiser stuff is top of the line. I use their microphone here, for example, and uh, sometimes if you're looking for the best, you got to pay a little bit more, and I really do like what they're doing here. Can't wait to show these to you. Sorry, I was playing a little burger time here, not doing very well. So we're taking a look at some stuff from Retrobit, and they are uh, really cranking out a lot of stuff this year because there's a whole emergence of retro gaming going on. We saw them last year, and now there's a lot more stuff this year because people like me who are aging uh, want to relive our childhood on our HD televisions, and they've got a bunch of new systems and a bunch of new controllers. This is called the Power Stick, and for those of us who remember, the uh, most sought-after joystick for your Nintendo Entertainment System was the NES Advantage. This one looks a lot like it, but it's all mechanical switches here. It clicks. Check, listen to this. So you've got mechanical switches here on the joystick itself and the buttons. It feels like an arcade stick, but uh, it's modeled after the NES Advantage stick. And I also want to show you, too, inside of this uh, Res Plus. I think we reviewed this one a few weeks ago. Uh, they're making new games and also licensing old games. And this cartridge, although it doesn't look like an NES cartridge from its casing, will work on the original system. So you can buy these games. They have multi-cart uh, packs here. They're all fully licensed and legit. You can pop them in these new systems or the old systems, and everything will work. So we're going to walk over and uh, check out a couple other things on that note. Um, they're releasing some new games as well. So this is called R-Type 3. 
and they're doing these collector's packs because retro gamers like to collect things, and you get a bunch of uh, feelies, as they used to call them back in the day, uh, the cartridge along with some stickers and some other things with the game. I think they also sell the game just standalone as a cartridge. They've got another one here, Joe and Mac, uh, that they're reviving as well. Again, the cartridges look a little different, but you are allow you're allowed to play these essentially on your old systems or your new ones too, which is pretty cool. Now let's go over here to this other little display. Uh, this is called Holy Diver, and there is a lot of stuff that you get with the collector edition here. So you get the uh, NES cartridge for your 8-bit Nintendo system. That one's gold, just like the old Zelda cartridges are. You get a little figurine that goes in there and stuff. People used to get games like this. When you bought a game, you get all this stuff with it, and they're trying to revive that. For those of us who remember, they've got some other games they're working on here, too. And there's some people playing this right now, so we'll just kind of show it from a little bit of a distance, and maybe Goldie can zoom in. But uh, this is the Super Retro tr Trio, and it plays the Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, uh, as well as the Nintendo Entertainment System, too. So you get all of that in one. You can hook up all your old controllers to it, and it'll work with their multi-carts or your original cartridges as well. We should probably try to get one of these in. We've been looking at all of these HD retro reboot cart, uh, consoles, and uh, these are the kinds of things that people buy as gifts for people in their lives. A lot of us have the cartridges, but not the consoles, or we want to hook it up to our HD TV, and it looks like a pretty cool system there. So we'll be on the lookout for that very soon. So here's one other thing worth taking a look at. This is the Go Retro Portable. It looks like a little Game Boy, but it has uh, about 350 games preloaded on it. Uh, many of them will be licensed, so some of your old retro Nintendo games will be on this thing. And what struck me about it was the price point, 35 bucks. They're going for big box retail, like your Walgreens and Best Buys and that kind of thing. And I think this might do pretty well. It feels well built. It doesn't feel cheap to me. It's got a nice little display. They're playing a football game I used to play as a kid. I can't remember the name of this one. And I just think it's pretty cool. Now, you can't put your own games on it, so you're going to be able to play only what's on the console itself. But again, this is something I think that might do really well in retail because it's a an affordable and cool stocking stuffer. So I'm going to get in trouble here because I can't leave this place. There's more stuff to see. Uh, here is some controllers that are licensed from Sega. We're going to start with the Genesis ones here. And they uh, have modeled the six-button controller, which some say, many say, maybe myself included, uh, was the best Sega Genesis controller there was. And they have two versions of it. So one will work uh, with the old systems with the original little plug thing, you know, what you expect. But they also have a USB version, and they're working on Bluetooth versions as well. And these are all officially licensed by Sega. They're going to be working with them to make sure they get it right. And a lot of us were fans of the Dreamcast, which did not uh, last as long as we would have liked it to have lasted. And they're uh, revitalizing Dreamcast controllers, too. They got a Bluetooth one. And they're also remaking new Dreamcast controllers, too, here, it looks like. And here's something else that's interesting, because a lot of people want to hook up their Dreamcast uh, to a nicer display. And the Dreamcast had a VGA output, but you needed the box to do it. And they're getting harder to find. Uh, they've got one here. It looks like they're going to revitalize that VGA adapter, not HDMI but a lot of televisions still support uh, VGA input, and you can get your Dreamcast hooked up with some better quality stuff. And let's not forget about the Sega Saturn, too. I'm, I actually bought a Saturn recently. I didn't own one back in the day, but they've got uh, some new controllers for that. Again, one for the original Saturn, and then one that has a USB connector. Sega made some really good controllers in the 90s, and they'll be very interested to see how close they get these to the originals. So we just stopped by the Zeiss booth and checked out their new product called VR1 Connect. Now, Zeiss makes lenses, and why this is relevant to VR is that they have a smartphone headset using some of the Zeiss lenses to give you some VR stuff. And this new product they have uh, is not only integrating some of their physical products, but also a software component to allow you to play Steam VR games using your smartphone. They've got a headset that you put your phone into, as I mentioned, along with two controllers. You don't get room scale in the sense that you can walk around like you might with the, uh, the HTC Vive, for example, but you can play all of the current Steam VR games on your phone stream to it over a USB cable. I found the experience to be pretty nice. In fact, the clarity of the image was better than my Vive. It was much better in focus. I didn't see as much uh, blurriness as I'm looking around, so I was pretty pleased with the image quality. Uh, there was a bit of latency, though. They had an iPhone 10 that they were using there with the OLED display, and I wonder if that might have contributed a little bit to the latency. So I'll have to try to get one of these things in, compare it. It works with the iPhone and the Android phone. Maybe try a few different phones and see which one works the best with it. But if you are looking to get into VR and don't want to spend 800 bucks on some VR system, $160 is what they're charging for this, and of course you will have to bring your own phone. And I finally got a chance to try out the HoloLens, something I've been eager to check out. And what do you know, NASA was at the show and had one there for me to play with. Here's what I thought. And I'm looking right now at a Mars landscape. Now I can't show you what I'm seeing, but 
I am really impressed with uh, how well this works. The head tracking is incredibly fast. I'm panning around this Mars scene here. Uh, behind me is a rover that I could walk up to, and the camera system here is tracking my, my presence in space so that uh, it's actually letting me explore the landscape here as I'm walking around. It's a really cool system that works exceptionally well, and I can see how this might be really useful for NASA when they're plotting out things with the rover because I'm seeing uh, in three dimensions here the topography of Mars as I'm moving my head around. The one issue with the HoloLens here, though, is that the field of view is very narrow. So while the head tracking is superb, uh, and all the room scale stuff is superb. I'm seeing basically a screen in front of my face, but I could see how if you had uh, transparent images here, this might be more effective. But I'm really eager to see how HoloLens comes around in its consumer version and how well they handle the field of view issue with it. But very impressive though. I'm really surprised by how well the head tracking is here. And I'd venture to say it's uh, maybe better than what I've seen on some of the consumer VR systems so far. So we're checking out something that has been out for a while that I hadn't really heard about too much. This is called the Game Vice, and uh, this particular model works with the iPhone, but they have an Android version too. And this is a third-party controller that uh, meets all the standards for Apple's official game controller standards. If you're playing a game like Vice City here, um, it should work pretty well on it. And what's nice about this is that as these iPhones change in size, uh, you shouldn't have too many problems finding a new, uh, you know, you don't have to buy a new controller every time they change the size of the iPhone. So uh, if I can have my friend here just take it out of the uh, case here, you can see how it works. So he's going to pause his game and just pop out the phone here. So it's pretty easy to get the phone in and out of it. And again, it's adjustable. So if you get a new iPhone that's a different size, you shouldn't be stuck. So these cost $79 for the mobile phone version, $99 for the iPad version, and they have an Android phone compatible version as well. So we were walking by this booth, and it was a nice booth, and it's from a company called Skyworth. And they haven't been in the US market, which is why I haven't really heard about them before, but they have been in the Chinese market for 30 years or so, and they are slowly making their way throughout the world. And what interested me was this television. Uh, this is a 43-inch set. They've got other sizes available as well. They've got OLEDs that they're working on too. Uh, but this is the second TV brand to integrate Android TV. So we all know Sony has been doing that for a while, but they were it. Uh, now you can get one of these. I think they said it starts at about $250 for a 43-inch set with Android TV built in. That's a pretty good price, I think, and uh, we'll be starting to see these more and more. They have been doing some test marketing around uh, the Seattle area, but they're meeting with uh, other brands at the show here. So I think as we see the year develop, we might see more of these televisions make their way to market and, again, integrated Android TV. So we just were walking by the Anchor booth, and this is a company that has grown quite a bit over the years. They were known for their uh, charging batteries and that kind of stuff. Stuff. I use one of their batteries, in fact, for my phone. And I'm getting into wireless charging now because my iPhone is a wireless charging device. And this is a kind of a neat little uh, wireless charging pad that I saw here. It can charge two devices at the same time. And that's cool in and of itself because if you have two people in your house with a uh, phone that can do charging this way, that's a good thing to do. You can see it works with cases also. Uh, but what's neat about this is that you can put the phone anywhere down on the pad. There, there's no real need to align it properly. So if I just kind of stick it in like that, you can see it's charging up already. If I move it around a little bit, maybe to the edge here, it'll charge. A lot of these things require sometimes a perfect centered placement. This one is just like you can stick it any which way on it, and it will uh, start charging the phone up, which I thought was pretty nice. So that was pretty helpful. And then if you're somebody that wants your phone to stand up, you can uh, stick it in like so on this little device here, and it will uh, also charge itself that way. So pretty cool little charging devices from Anchor. They make really neat stuff, and uh, these are some products that I think are pretty cool. Now here's another product. If you are a road warrior, you might find of interest, and you have a USB Type-C port. This is the PowerPort Sync, and it looks like a USB-C hub, which it is. You got HDMI on here. You've got four USB 3.0 ports over here and another USB Type-C port there. But you'll notice at the top here, it has power going in, and that means that this can act as your power adapter in addition to working uh, as the dock. So you can carry one less dongle with you because the power adapter is the dongle. Probably better for Ultrabooks. It's only 30 watts of power, but I think it is something that might be very useful to people that do walk around with some of those low-powered laptops with USB-C. So one more piece of charging apparatus here at the Anchor booth is this thing. Now, this will output 100 watts total distributed across these ports. And for example, if you plugged in uh, maybe a high-powered laptop in the top port here, you can get all 100 watts out, and then it would split based on uh, whatever else you plugged in. But they told me they're developing an app to allow you to distribute the power load across these USB ports yourself. So if you're just charging a 
small USB device, you can allocate it maybe 15 watts of power and have the rest go to the top there, and it will do that through an app. So a very smart charging device here. They have some other ones in this line as well. These are called the power ports that uh, deliver a lot of power in a small space. So if you look at the one on the end here, this one, uh, this will deliver 27 watts, which is good for most of the MacBooks out there, actually, in a size about what you would normally have with an iPhone charger. So not very big and can charge up quite a bit. If you're often having a hard time finding room in your bag, uh, these things are pretty tiny. Now, another theme of the show have been a lot of these old established brands finding ways to make their products smarter. And there's a plumbing company called Upanor, I believe, uh, which has been around for a very long period of time making plumbing fixtures. And they teamed up with Belkin on this thing called the Fin. And what this does is it measures your water flow in your house, but not just for analytical purposes. It's also able to detect if you have frozen pipes or some kind of pipe bursting. It knows what your uh, usual water flow should be and if it notices anything out of the ordinary it'll send an alert to your phone and then you can even shut the water off uh, from your phone anywhere you where you are in the world or in certain situations I think it can do it automatically for you and this is about $850 so it is in, on first blush kind of an expensive thing for uh, a one single purpose but at the same time if you contemplate what a burst pipe would cost to repair I think it'd be a lot less expensive to have a very minimal amount of water come out the wrong way than just having your pipe going constantly and where I live it's very cold we have frozen pipes as a real constant uh, problem where I'm where I am and it causes a lot of damage every year this might be something really helpful to have, especially for people that own rental properties or aren't home all that often. Uh, what's happening this year is that Google is very aggressively pushing their assistant, uh, Google Home and the assistant that you can run on your uh, own devices and whatnot, and they're really going for Amazon Alexa this year. And everywhere I go, I'm seeing a Google Home doing something. In fact, when we were at that car demonstration earlier, uh, they were summoning the car with a Google Home, not with a phone, which really would be the better uh, way to go about it. But I'm hearing that Google has really been working with a lot of these brands to uh, try to get this, this Hey Google branding out all over the place and it is everywhere here. So we encountered another 180 camera that's going to work with Google Daydream and YouTube and everything. Uh, this is the Yi Horizon camera and what's cool about this one is that it is a 180 3D camera but it also has a screen that you can see uh, pivots up to the top so you can do a 3D selfie perhaps or It'll pivot back down here to the back of the device and you can uh, use it like any other standard camera. So you can kind of see what you are shooting out of it. The display is not 3D, but the output will be. And one of the neat things about this that I'm really eager to try out is that uh, when you have one of these cameras, you can stream live 3D uh, 180 degree videos on YouTube. So we could do a live stream where you can see depth in my studio as we're doing something. I just think that's a cool thing that I'm eager to try out. Uh, these are gonna come out in the spring. Uh, the price point they're saying is probably around the $400 or less mark. Uh, they don't have a price just yet. I love mechanical keyboards and if you do too, you probably are using a switch made by this company, Cherry. And we've got a keyboard on the docket to review a little later this week in their new silent line of uh, mechanical keyboards, but I found this mouse that they just introduced here. This is called the MC4900, and it doesn't have any real fancy uh, switches on it like the keyboards do, but it has a fingerprint sensor that is Windows Hello compatible, so you can authenticate with your laptop without an additional dongle, for example, or your desktop. Uh, if you don't have a USB port available, you can do it all right through the mouse and get into your Windows computer without a password. So we got a cool tour here at Clarion set up on the North Plaza. We were lucky because the power went out at the convention center. They kicked everybody out for a while and we were due to be here. So this was a great little time that we had. So you might know Clarion from all their car stereo systems on the consumer level, but they also make a lot of components that go inside of cars. And like all of the other vehicle component manufacturers, they're focused on autonomy. And today they were showing off uh, some autonomous parking systems. Uh, one was something that might integrate with a valet system so that when you pull into a parking garage, for example, you could get out of the car, the car would communicate with the valet system, and then it would park itself and then come back and get you when you were done. That's something I've been waiting a long time for. In fact, I would probably forego other kinds of automation first to be able to just go somewhere, get out of the car, and have it go park itself. So we saw a demo of that, and you can see the car just driving around the parking lot here doing that. I got to ride inside during one of these autonomous demonstrations, and I was able to see how the autonomy worked even just driving around in a short course here. Uh, we couldn't film inside the car, unfortunately. It's pretty cool that we're getting 
getting closer to this point, but one of the things that struck me was that there was a lot of components required for this system, and they're all built as separate little modules, and they do this because Clarion makes a lot of different components, and different auto manufacturers who use this technology decide to implement things in different ways. There's all these little different boxes in there, and they don't make a uh, common system to do all that. And we saw some other things here, including some new ways to uh, interface with your vehicle, some touchscreen navigation systems that allow you to have four different things up at once, very easy to navigate and move around while the car was moving. Uh, they had some driver attention technology so that if you maybe look down at your phone too often, uh, the car is going to start telling you to pay attention. It's even got the ability that if you become incapacitated to safely pull the car over. And one other thing that uh, was quite intriguing was their cleaning system for the cameras on these cars. Autonomous vehicles require a lot of cameras to operate and those cameras need to be cleaned and they had a system uh, that was both data driven, in other words knowing when the camera is dirty, but also mechanical uh, to get stuff off of these cameras. They had an air blower that would blow some air on there to free dirt and then if needed it would also spray water and the system was smart enough to know whether it needed water, air or both and it just really goes to show you how much goes into every little component of these autonomous driving systems and it's also pretty intriguing too to think uh, our brains do all this stuff that all of these systems do automatically yet there is so much that to think about when trying to automate the process of driving a car. So that's going to wrap up our CES dispatch coverage. I'll probably be talking more about this on the wrap-up next week as I process what I have looked at here. So hopefully you enjoyed what we found on the show floor today. This year I was really looking for different things. We could talk about different iterations of computers or whatever, but we do get a lot of computers in on the channel throughout the course of the year, and I really want to look for new things, things that really caught my interest and eye as I was wandering around the floor here. Uh, one thing I would say that the IoT space, the uh, Internet of Things, the smart plugs and the light bulbs and everything are starting to make more sense to me than they did in years past. The first year that I came to the show was like the real first year of IoT back in 2014 or 2013 or so, and they didn't work well together. Everybody had a different app and there wasn't a lot of interoperability. Uh, now it looks like we're starting to see devices that uh, really are now functional across these different platforms. You can buy different brands and have them all work the same with your Google Home or your Alexa, for example. Example, and uh, I'm seeing a lot of standardization right now, uh, mostly around Google uh, Home or and Google Assistant and uh, Alexa, not so much on HomeKit. I think there's a higher bar to pass to get Apple certification. So a lot of that kind of thing going on here, a lot of refinement of stuff, uh, not so much in new and gee whiz kind of technology here. So we'll see what uh, future years bring. But I'm going to go back to my point that I made last time, which is that I think we really hit a crescendo on the development of all these little processors doing amazing things. And I think we need a next big jump in technology to really start seeing some wildly new technology at these shows. But let me know what you thought of our coverage. I wish I could do another day here, but unfortunately I have to get back to my uh, some things back at home. So uh, we're not going to be able to cover the full week here, but I hope I was able to give you a good glimpse into the, what the CES show is about and some of the things that we found that caught our interest while we were out here. I also want to thank Goldie Chan, who's been behind the camera the entire week, and she did a great job and, uh, you know, really I ran her a little ragged, but we are very hungry now. We're going to go get some dinner, and uh, she's been really great in helping us get the coverage done. She also uh, did the show with us last time as well, and you can check her out on LinkedIn. She's got a great video channel there. I also want to thank our sponsors, Silicon Dust, for uh, sponsoring us once again, and they've got that great new six-tuner uh, HD Home Run Prime that you'll probably want to check out for your cord shaving and whatnot. And that's going to do it for now, but a lot more to come when I get back home. This is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters including Gold Level supporters, the Black Eyed and Blues Music Hour podcast, Chris Allegretta, Steve Blixt, Stanley Taub, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.